Back when I was younger, I was pretty carefree. I didn't think a lot about much. Nowadays it's different. Our world is a very precious commodity. I think about a lot. And we need to stand together to protect this precious body we call the Earth. Today I sat down with Dr. Twyla Dell, PhD. Twyla worked for the EPA and she's got a lot of knowledge, extensive background on our environment and fuels. She wrote a book titled Fueling Change and that's what we talked to Dr. Dell about today. Every time I get into my vehicle, I have to think, what am I going to do with the trip that I make today? I live 50 miles outside of Klamath Falls, Oregon. So it's a hundred miles round trip for me to go to the store and do my grocery shopping. It kind of forces me to focus on my needs a little bit more. We talk about that today with Dr. Dell, and it's a fascinating journey that she writes about in her book. I highly recommend you pick up a copy of this book. The history involved within this writing is spectacular. I can't wait for you to read Dr. Dell's book, Fueling Change. Let's not waste any more time and get into this excellent interview with Dr. Twyla Dell. To overcome, you must educate. Educate not only yourself, but educate anyone seeking to learn. We are all dead America. We can all learn something. To learn, we must challenge what we already understand. The way we do that is through conversation. Sometimes we have conversations with others. However, some of the best conversations happen with ourself. Reach out and challenge yourself. Let's dive in and learn something right now. Today we have a special treat for you. We have Dr. Twyla Dell with us. She is the author of Fueling Change. Twyla, would you please introduce yourself and let the people know your background and what you do? Hi, Ed. I'd be glad to. I am the author of Fueling Change, How We Created Climate Change, One Fuel at a Time. It's my eighth book. I've been an environmental educator since 1990. Back in 1990, I thought we could save the world by stopping burning the rainforest, which if you were uh, in the know back then, that's what we were all wringing our hands over. And by the way, 30 years later, we're still burning the rainforest, and uh, there's still about half of it left, so you have some idea how very vast it was. Over that time, I have spent uh, going to graduate school, getting a PhD in environmental studies at uh, Antioch University, Keene, New Hampshire, and writing this book about uh, Kansas City. Kansas City, Missouri, which I live next to, as an untold story, a revelation of how we created climate change one fuel at a time by going through the last of the Wood Age, which happened to be right on the shores of the western Missouri in 1820s. We had spent a mi we humanity had spent a million years going through the Wood Age, learning how to be human, how to organize ourselves, how to uh, create laws and religion and cities. I mean, it was a long trek, all using wood as fuel. That's why we call it the Wood Age. And then right as Kansas City was being born, that was the end of the Wood Age because 
we went into the coal age and we started that on the east coast of america there are many reasons for that and we can get into that and we went into the coal age which gave us railroads we badly needed them and not too far into the coal age we acquired oil we'd never had a liquid fuel didn't know what to do with it but learned how fast so suddenly after a million years of having one fuel we had three fuels wood coal and oil and then out of oil came gasoline and we went into the 20th century with gasoline as the star of the oil age and we have enjoyed oh my god how we have enjoyed gasoline at the same time there's been a very heavy effect of using gasoline not the least of which is the slaughter of billions of animals and million of people uh, and the uh architecture of the 20th century being laid out to support cars uh, suburbia and all of that and now we come to the beginning of the 21st century and we have to give up gasoline in order to move on into the next fuel which is the solar age so what made you take the path in life that brought you to helping fight climate change I started in uh, my childhood, actually, get coming, uh, ver becoming very intimate with a piece of real estate in Oregon where I spent my grade school year. It was just a fairy land of primeval forest and, and lake and cabin. Uh, all through my elementary school years, I became very close to that, very primal. And uh, that became my background. I didn't there were no words to describe it. I didn't even know the word environment until I heard it uh, in my late high school years. But that gave me an intimate feeling of a an ecosystem working and and renewing itself every year. And eventually, I ended up going to work for the Environmental Protection Agency. And it was a surprise to me to realize that we had so many laws protecting so many different parts of our environment from water to air to soil. And actually, that was the three parts of the planet, water, air, and soil. That's what the planet is. That's who we are. And uh, our bodies represent that trinity just the same as the uh, soil being the body, the water being the circulatory system, and the air being what we breathe to stay alive. So we are miniature representatives of the planet itself. So what we do to the planet, we ultimately do to ourselves. And uh, after I left the Environmental Protection Agency, I created a, an environmental leadership program a two and a half day weekend retreat to train business and community leaders, teachers and students. And I trained about a thousand people over a six year period. And I thought, my God, we're going to save the earth. We're going to stop all this destruction. Each one of these students is going to go out and be a soldier. And for all I know, they did, but it's just not that simple. We need millions of soldiers to help transform our wasteful ways into sustainable ways. And that's what we're doing now. We're just at the beginning of that. That's excellent. So your book, Fueling Change, how long did it take you to research and write this book? About six years. It's about 438 pages and a hundred and some illustrations. And it is a brand new thesis. As far as I know, no one else has traced uh, a particular city, and this would be a wonderful exercise for any of your audience members to do, to take their city and look at it uh, by identifying this power, this force that is so big we don't even know it's there. And that's called the fuel we use to create the kind of culture that we have. And that's my thesis it's on the back of the book but anyway it says history is simpler than we think it's all about fuel all the time and that's what our ancestors learned over that long 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 progress toward becoming who we are today 
It's all about fuel all the time. The more fuel you have, the more power you have. And America is the power on the world today because we have all that oil. And we have learned to create a civilization that not only serves us, but it polices the world. And we have all of our trade alliances based on oil. It's a very intricate process and relationship. But that's who we are today because, and when they say, oh, the richest in the, na- uh, in the world, we're the richest nation in the world. Yes, because we have all this oil. It doesn't mean that all of our citizens have access to the kind of life support that they deserve to have because they live here. Those two things don't jibe, and we're learning to realize that. So the Wood Age, ending in the 1800s, it's replaced by the Coal Age. Then in comes the oil in the early 1900s. You say by the 2020s that we must stop use of gasoline and replace it with bicycles, electric cars, and electric highways. Could you talk us through this journey from the wood age into the transition needed towards the next step in fuels? Yeah, that's a very broad (laughs) subject. Uh, But I need people to become familiar with the vocabulary of fuel. We need to bring fuel into the foreground of our lives instead of the invisible background where it lives now. So that's why in my book, the first hundred pages go through what it was like to live in the wood age, uh, how we used water for transport and the Herculean uh, progress of human bodies against a uh, current going downriver so that we had to push our boats upriver. It was a very, very difficult thing. And then when steamboats came along, that was the beginning of the end for the wood age because we had an internal combustion. Well, we had an external combustion uh, engine, but we had the, uh, the last moments of the wood age. We used wood as fuel in an engine. And that was a big moment because we had an engine which was invented in England to empty the coal mines of water so we could get to coal, which was our next fuel. If England hadn't run out of wood, we wouldn't have had the steam engine, but the scarcity always forces us to go on to the next fuel. So um, to get from the wood age to the solar age, you really need to look at the book, thumb through, just look at the pictures if nothing else. Uh, Look at the... uh, graph at the beginning where you see the 100% uh, use of wood fuel precipitously declines as coal rises and then oil rises. And this is the harmonic background to our lives. So now we get to the beginning of the solar age. We've always been in the solar age, but we're becoming conscious of using the solar power that is available to us to replace the very 20th century lifestyle that we've had. Uh, Yeah, bicycles. Yeah, solar panels. Yeah, Zoom, staying home. We're not very happy with that at the moment. We really are going to need to become much more comfortable with it. If you understand, and global warming is not a belief, a belief like Santa Claus uh, or the Tooth Fairy. It is not in that category. Those things you believe that aren't true It is a scientific reality that the poles are melting and a host of other events are occurring. And we need to reduce the load of carbon dioxide that we are putting into the air. That is the irrefutable truth. The poles are melting, North Pole and South Pole. Even though I have snow on my lawn today, it's still melting the sea levels rise when the ice melts. And this is the reason that there is so much panic about global warming because the sea levels are rising. You chase that upstream. That's because we have too much carbon dioxide in the air, which causes the atmosphere to warm, which melts the North Pole and the South Pole. So let's talk about the transition period we're in right now. 
this could take some time to fully transition into any type of fully supported energy or fuel structure. How can we make sure that we transition into a cleaner, safer fuel supply? It's a very complex process, needless to say. We have a very mature uh, oil age going on, and the big uh, leader of that is gasoline. And I call it the sculptress of our ways and means because we've used gasoline to create our entire life structure. Here we are in, here I am in suburbia, laid out by gasoline. So, well, we don't have the luxury of the 30 years that a lot of people predict because the uh, temperature is rising too fast for us to just lackadaisically move in that direction. We are at, shamefully, one and a half percent of um, electric cars on the road today. I'm just talking about America. One and a half percent. In order to get to the solar age, we have to be 50 percent. How do we do that? We have to do that very quickly. And uh, we need to uh, purchase, first of all, let your pocketbook vote with your credit card and buy electric. If you don't want to buy electric and you, don't, you can't or you're not ready to, then look at the very measurable, this is so important, the very measurable process of cutting back on gasoline. Every gallon of gasoline we burn leaves behind 20 pounds of carbon dioxide. And you go, what? Who says that? Well, it's true. The Energy Information Agency and the EPA have both measured this and various other scientific agencies that a gallon of gasoline, when burned, leaves behind 20 pounds of CO2. You don't see that coming out of your pipe, tailpipe, because the particulates are very fine. But that's what happens. So you uh, buy a tank of gasoline, say 15 gallons. Each one of those burns 20 pounds. So 20 times 15, that's 300 pounds of carbon dioxide you are going to leave behind for every tank of gasoline. Suppose you burn a tank of gasoline a week, 15 gallons, you know, 300 pounds times 52, that's 15,000 pounds. Really? Is that what you want to be doing? If you had seen that piece of information when you bought the car, you know, you're in the showroom, spotlights on this gorgeous vehicle, and by any stretch, it is a gorgeous piece of engineering, uh, you have the sticker on the left rear window, and it tells you EPA says this, and some other scientific agency says that, and you're going to pay this amount. And, and you go, gulp, that's going to be $2,500 worth of gasoline, and of course I'm going to pay it, because this is how we live, and uh, you're going to get so many miles to the gallon, and this is the EPA standards. But does it say anywhere on there, oh, by the way, for every gallon of gasoline you burn through this vehicle, you're going to leave behind 20 pounds of carbon dioxide? No, it doesn't say that. If it did, you'd say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want to do that. How do I drive without doing that? That's the big question that faces us now. You have to go to a hybrid. You have to go to an electric. You walk. You stay home and Zoom. These are our alternatives. That's the way we have to go. And we have to push that very quickly. In the next five years, we go from one and a half percent of electric cars to, say, 10 percent by next year to 20 percent by the following year. You understand me? This is a major revolution that lies ahead of us. And it has to be pushed by knowledgeable consumers. And that is what our future looks like. Or not. If you don't wish to do that, you stay in the 20th century where we are now. Because as long as fossil fuel driving cars are running around, we haven't entered the 21st century. Yeah, that's a good segue point. Climate change needs to be a more serious conversation for sure. I feel that it's become hypersensitized and politicized 
Why do you feel this has become the norm? What is it? But just the hypersensitivity and the politicizing of the climate well, change needs. Change is hard. Change is very hard. And we certainly have that being acted out in our political uh, drama right now. Uh, yet, uh, we have to face very stark choices in this regard. You have to realize if you don't want to reduce your driving, if, as and I ask, I have a I have a workbook out called "The Gasoline Diet: Drive Less, Lose Pounds, Save the Planet." Does this tank of gasoline make me look fat? Yes, it does. <laughs> Either walk it with your fingers or walk it with your feet. Yeah, this tank of gasoline yeah. makes me look fat unless I move to a new uh, idea. And we have to move there whether we want to or not. When the planet warms up and the ice in the Arctic melts to the point that it is no longer cooling the planet, that is a very different place to live, and you will not like it. And your kids will say, what the heck? Why didn't they do this? Well, they just didn't like change. Well, isn't that too bad? Uh, it's going to happen to you. It's not going to run down the generations to your grandkids. So that's the hard truth. And best to embrace it and be the edge of change rather than the actionary uh, minority with their heels dug in going, hell no, I won't go. It's really a very simple choice, ultimately. Going into the 21st century and as fast as we can, say 10% uh, electric cars a year, uh, that's 10 years, 15% of electric cars a year, uh, mixed with Zoom and uh, other elements, bicycles, yeah, it's going to be an interesting mess. But that's what change is. We get to the other side, we'll let go some of those things that served us in the interim. How exciting that's, to be in charge of changing point. the planet. Yeah, that's a good point right there. You know, we, we have to act. We have to take action. And right. if we don't take and action, these are our choices. things don't change. What is your thought on how we live in our modern world? Should we stop building major metropolitans and go back to the family farms? Well, you know, what we have lost in the way of understanding of the agricultural life, it was one hell of a hard life. Hellishly hard to grow a crop out of a field of dry dirt. And as soon as fertilizers came along, that released the agricultural revolution. And then all of those post-war tanks turned into massive agricultural tractor machines. And we had the agricultural revolutions. If we remove that, we're back to a field of hard dirt. And so we don't want to merrily uh, dismiss what we have learned in order to go back to absolute backbreaking work of farming without some kind of mechanized, fuel-driven vehicles. You understand that we have to very carefully figure that out. But ultimately, uh, we become more village-oriented. We have fewer miles to travel to get where we're going. We've already discovered that so many of us can work from home. There is a huge office building just being built uh, a few blocks from me, it is just one of those glassy environmental cubes. I have no idea who is going to occupy it, but I can say it is absolutely obsolete before it opens its doors. And I don't know if the builders of that are keeping that truth from themselves in complete denial, or they expect 500 people to drive in there and park and physically go in and fill those offices. What's your guess? I, I think we have a big problem, and the more oils, fuels, and, you know, it gets really compounded when we talk about fuels and, you know, oils, because we have mining that goes on for our ores and our oils, and then we have all of these other industries that are focused on 
bringing oil and fuels to the table. So I think we have to find this proper medium to balance our ecosystem where we're not like strip mining and doing Mm -hmm. devastation to our world. And there's obvious problems with emissions going into our atmosphere. The EPA has done strides on this, you know, back in the seventies when they started really looking into this hard and changing the fuels and the smokestacks they've been changing how emissions are being put in it's a very fine line and i think we really need to lighten the load on our metropolitan areas and bring more people outward into the rural areas and learn how to be less dependent on the ease of living that we have created. So yes, like you stated, there's this tremendous workload on a farm. I live on a farm. I maintain a little farm here and you know what it's a hundred miles. Yeah. It's a hundred miles for me to go to the store and back round trip. Wow. So when I make a trip, I really plan. I really make sure I'm going to use that trip wisely. We yeah, need more people doing that. It, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Uh, another thing I think is the trash issues. I listened to a few podcasts that you've been on, and you talk a little bit about this recycling. I think we need to really get grips on our plastic uses and what we throw away, how we really live life really needs to be uncovered and reworked again. So that's my thought on that, Twyla. Yeah. So after all said and done about the fuel dependency, we still have this major problem with the manufacturing and mining of the ores needed to produce whatever fuel or our hungry lives depend on, how do we spread the message of slowing our need for such harmful things in our world? Yeah, well, you have to start by stopping burning as much gasoline as you can because that is the fire that's raging and so we have to put that down to a smolder in order to save the actual uh, atmosphere of the planet that's the essence of global warming it there is a pandemic going on in on the planet before the pandemic of of covid ever came along and that is the bio geo uh, whatever, whatever pandemic of loss of ecosystem, loss of life, loss of complexity, et cetera, that we have created in a cascade of, of uh, damages that we have uh, allowed to ripple out. So how do you stop that? How do you reverse it? It's very complex, but just understand that fuel drives our lives every minute. Anybody who's listening to this is surrounded by uh, fuel created uh, wires and processes and, and things. You know, you'd, I'm I'm sitting in a plethora of things brought to me by the oil age and the gasoline age. Somehow we have to back off from that. We want to keep what the the benefits and uh, reduce the harm, and we need to do that in short order in order to keep the beautiful planet that we have. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a big subject for a lot more talk. But first of all, we have to become aware of it. Like you are, you're very carefully using your gasoline. And uh, for us in suburbia, for instance, I go to the grocery store. It's about a mile away. Oh, by the way, if you break down the 20 pounds of carbon dioxide, it's about a mile. It's about a pound a mile. So if you go into town, it's 100 pounds in, 100 pounds back. 
and that is probably not something you want to hear. That's why you are carefully organizing your trip. So I go up to the grocery store. That's a pound of carbon dioxide to get to the grocery store. We have to see it at this level. Uh, then it's a pound back. I take my dogs in to be groomed. That's a pound over there and a pound back. I go to see my friend. Uh, that's a pound over and a pound back. I go to the doctor's office. She's seven miles away. That's seven pounds over, seven pounds back. You see what I'm talking about? This is what we oh, do. Yes. We do this all day, every day. Or if you go to work, maybe it's a 25-mile round trip, five days a week. That begins to really add up. And then all of your other workers are also doing that much. So in order to fill that building that I just described, that's how many thousands of pounds of carbon dioxide do those people leave behind in order to drive to that building to get to their jobs and do whatever it is they're going to do? That's the wonderful thing about gasoline. You can measure it down to the pound, down to the mile. And that's what the gasoline diet does, as well as fueling change, how we created climate change one fuel at a time. Just understand that every breath you take, every move you make is backed up by fuel to support our very 20th century life. Yes, and fuel comes in many ways. You know, we talked it a lot about... Itself. Right. Yes. You know, and we talk about the fuel we all know about, like gasoline, coal, wood, but the fuel and energy of the human being and the beast of burden in the field. Yeah. That built us up to this point where we demand this convenience, this ease. So. There's a lot of work to be done, Twyla, and you've taken on, on a lot on your journey. I do respect that. That's a burden. <laughs> I don't know. Well, the how point to of my it. spear is gasoline, and that very simple. Take your car keys in your hand, and before you go jumping into your vehicle to do some fairly frivolous trip, Realize you can either do it or not based on your realization and your inventiveness. Uh, maybe you uh, delay it or you combine it or you decide not to do it. Uh, you have to start realizing, okay, I'm going over to do so-and-so. That's 10 miles away. That's 10 pounds. Got to come back. That's another 10 pounds. Yeah. Get into that frame of mind and then we begin to change what we have to do. That's right. So how can people get a hold of you and connect and get involved with what you're doing? Thank you. Well, they can get the book at Amazon.com. And that is how uh, fueling change, how we created climate change one fuel at a time. They can find me at how we can stop climate change dot com now dot com. How we can stop climate change now dot com where I have a, about 45 blogs. I've taken a leave of absence from blogging because of uh, COVID and uh, the personal tragedies of my own uh, particular situation. I'm about to start blogging again and uh, find me, uh, just Google Twyla Dell. I have four different websites. You will certainly find me there. Amazing woman. Twyla Dell, we thank you for being with us here on Dead America and enjoy your thank afternoon. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us today. If you found this podcast enlightening, entertaining, educational in any way, please share, like, subscribe, and join us right back here next week for another great episode of Dead America Podcast. I'm Ed Waters, your host. Enjoy your afternoon, wherever you may be.